terms of this ummah, you know, focusing upon their 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 world and of course focusing upon their religion. It's just an amazing thing. Uh, I was sharing something with some of the youth. Um, it was a time of the successorship of Amr ibn al-Khattab. Um, I'm not sure how much you know history you guys, I, I love history. I actually do uh, a comprehensive seerah of the Prophet I'm doing it over 120 weeks. Um, so I got to like 35 of them. Uh, one of the sessions, like when I was talking about Amr ibn al-Khattab, at the time of his khilafah, which means that the time when he became the leader, and and if you don't understand anything, please stop me. If I use a you know a, a word or you know terminology that you don't understand, please stop me and and understand. It's just it is not a lecture; it's something that we can all understand. So it was it said that it, it was a time of the khilafah, meaning the leadership of Umar ibn al-Khattab. The Prophet peace be upon him left the face of this earth at the age of sixty-three. The Islamic calendar was approximately eleven years after Hijra. The Prophet, peace be upon him, left and Abu Bakr became, radiallahu anhu, became the successor. He stayed for about two years, three months, and ten days. He also passes away. And now Umar ibn al-Khattab takes this position. His khilafah and successorship stays for about ten years and six months. This was known as the golden era or the golden time, the climax, and so many things were accomplished. Um, during the time of the khilafah of Umar, radiallahu anhu, there is an incident which is mentioned by Imam al-Bukhari. You might have come across the name Bukhari, very famous writer of hadith. He has compiled a big book of hadith known as Al-Bukhari. He has done many works. Not Bukhari is not the only work that he has done. He's known as Bukhari because he was from an area known as Al-Bukhara. There is a book that he has also worked upon and written called Tariq al-Saghir, which means the history, a smaller version of the history itself. In that book, he narrates the story. In that story, he mentions that it was the time of the Khilafah or the successorship of Umar ibn al-Khattab. And the people who were in audience were some of the most elite, most intellectual, spiritual individuals of the time. Meaning, there were people from the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, still alive. Such as 99 amongst the 313 people from Badr, right? The incident of Badr was a huge you know, war that happened and there were those who were given so much honor and dignity. So people from amongst that time and people from you know the most important of the incidents were still <coughs> present, and majority of them were present. At this moment, Umar ibn Khattab anhu, gathered the people and said, Taman now, make a wish. What do you see as a revival for this nation? Like how do we bring back this nation the honor and dignity or that level it was it was at when we were at the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him? Meaning, what do you suggest? Right? That, that he was brainstorming with them. And a lot of time hasn't passed. Two years, three months, and ten days of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Few years within his own system. It's not a lot of time, but of course, it cannot match the time of the Prophet peace be upon him. So he's asking them, like, think. What do you think? Tamanna. The word tamanna itself in Arabic refers to make a wish, right? Dream mm -hmm. as big as you can. So a person gave an advice, a second person gave an advice, and of course, Tariq al-Saghir, which is a detailed book, gives you know, the details of what every single individual mentioned. Some said we should gather gold, and someone said we should gather this, and we give it to the poor individuals, their hearts will become soft, they will come towards religion, and everyone gave their advice. While everyone was done, Amr ibn al-Khattab, of course, he's a giant in, in, in the name of history itself, the Prophet, peace be upon him, upon the virtues of Amr, mentioned that if there was a prophet after me, it would have been you, but the doors of prophecy have closed. Mm -hmm. Meaning he was that individual. Um, at this moment, Amr said, can I share with you what I would wish? They say, yeah, please. He said, I wish that this entire room was filled with the likes of three individuals. And he named three people. Meaning these were the role models for Amr ibn Khattab. Meaning the man who everyone wished that they could be like, he said, I wish that these three people were amongst us all the time. And then he gave three names. He said, Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah, Mu'ad ibn Jabal, and Hudayfa ibn Yaman. It's a detailed hadith. But why did he name, name these three individuals? That's the reason why I actually want to touch upon it. Of course, I get to Ramadan in just a second. Mufisa, you told me about Ramadan. I'm going to come to that in just a second. He said, Umar al Allah said, you know why I chose these three individuals? The first man who's known as Abu Ubaidah. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, for every nation there is an Amin. Amin means a person who is a custodian. A person that who you can trust. 
a person who will fulfill a promise, something that you can leave which is the most precious and know that you will get back in its exact form without any harm to it. The greatest custodian of my nation is Abu Ubaidah. So he said, not only that individual, but I wish that that quality was present in this army, meaning people. The second quality which he mentioned was a man known as Mu'adh. Mu'adh radiallahu anhu was known for his knowledge. He was known as a man as a mountain of knowledge. So his desire was not only Mu'adh, but his desire was that I wish knowledge can come back to my nation. Knowledge can be revived. So he actually wanted to talk about three attributes. The first attribute was what? Amana, which means taking care, being the right custodian of the religion itself, or the rights and valuables of others. Number two, knowledge, knowledge. And I emphasize upon this a lot. I have, when I do my programs, I do Arba'ina Nabawi, the program, <coughs> you know, I was doing this program with the adults in, in New York, and I said the two challenges that I practically see that this nation as Muslims face now, one is lack of prophetic knowledge, and second is differences of opinion within our own zones. Mm -hmm. Be it cultural, be it religious, be it social, be it anything. That has just divided the ummah into so small piece, pieces that we are unable to face our exterior challenges. Mm -hmm. These are the two greatest interior challenges that I see amongst the Muslims. Differences of opinion, be it cultural, be it religious, be it anything. And secondly, the lack of prophetic knowledge, which has not allowed us to face the challenges which are exterior challenges. And that's not allowed us that. A person who is not stable within their own house cannot fix someone else's house, right? as a nation, as an ummah. So going back to the hadith that I was mentioning, the story that I was mentioning. So he said, I wish the likes of three people. The first quality from the man of Uwaida was Amin al -Dhamma. A few years ago, I love traveling, so at least once a year I like to travel with my wife and my kids. This year we were in Al-Aqsa, Jordan, and we went to uh, Al-Quds, uh, Palestine. We saw you know, the, the Dome of the Rock and stuff. A few years back, I was in the Valley of Jordan, uh, and I actually went to the grave where Abu Ubaidah radiallahu anh, is buried. On top of the plaque where he's buried, it says the prophetic saying that for every nation there is a custodian, and the custodian of this ummah is this man. And wallahi, it gave me goosebumps. I almost like fell to the ground just reading this and seeing that, wow, this man, is where the pinnacle and the excellence of, of amana and trust was in this ummah, and how much of that is left in our nation. Anyway, so he said three things, amana, custodianship, number two, knowledge, and the third thing which I, I wanted to refer to all of you guys was, he said Hudayfa ibn Yaman, and who is Hudayfa ibn Yaman? Hudayfa said, whenever anyone asked for something good, I would always ask for something evil so that I can avoid it, and I can stay away from it. So scholars have mentioned this, the quality that Hudayfa had was, Perfect balance between the <coughs> dunya, this world, and the hereafter. Perfect balance between the world and the hereafter. And I don't want to relay this as two different things. Many a times we begin to think that for us, our religion is our mosque and our four walls of the mosque. But that's a that's completely wrong perception. My religion is how I treat my family, my friends, my work, my responsibilities, right? A religion of a person is not attached to the mosque only, it's their 24-hour life. Mm -hmm. So it was a perfect balance that Hudayfa ibn Yaman struck between their world, meaning the involvement of the world, and the preparation of the hereafter. So of course, I started off by saying this, that I'm, I'm always inspired by, by individuals like yours, you that, mashallah, you guys are keeping the balance of, of your works and then trying to also focus upon deen. May Allah protect and preserve you guys. Mm -hmm. For the few, to, for few minutes that we have together, post Ramadan, right? Post Ramadan, I guess post Ramadan blues sometimes as well, is that it's a time that you begin to sometimes, you know, as soon as the, uh, the month of Ramadan finishes, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a weird feeling in a way that you're happy that Eid is here, but you're also missing out on, on the moments of the month of Ramadan. Um, Sheikh Inam Rahimahullah, who was a great scholar in Hind, he used to say something so beautiful. He said, when a person, you know, really spends their Ramadan in ibadah, in worship, in seclusion, all the things that they have to, as soon as the Eid comes, the announcement of Eid, it brings a joy to them, right? It, it, the, the day of Eid brings that joy. So he used to always say, he said, live your life like Ramadan and receive your death like the announcement of Eid, right? He always used to say this. 
He used to say, when we live Ramadan in that piety and then you see the announcement of Eid, it just brings so much joy. He said, if our lives were like Ramadan, you will find your death like the announcement of Eid. You need the days of celebration, the announcement of success for that individual. So looking at Ramadan, it's actually something that we should keep for our lifetime. That's why the Prophet, peace be upon him, said that if the people knew the virtue of the month of Ramadan, they would wish that the entire year was the month of Ramadan. Right? One scholar had mentioned that Yusuf, alayhi salam, who was the son of Yaqub, right? Joseph, who was son of, of, of Jacob, the whole story in the Quran, chapter number 12, what a beautiful story itself. It is mentioned that Yaqub, which is a prophet of Allah, he had 12 sons. And the sons committed a mistake in which they threw their own brother Yusuf in a well. They want to get, you know, lose him. But what happened? Because of Yusuf, the prophet of Allah, all the other brothers were forgiven. All the other brothers. So a scholar was given a metaphor, an example. He said, the month of Ramadan is like Yusuf. And the 11 brothers are like the 11 months. Your Ramadan becomes the means of forgiveness of all your other months, right? So he says, take that as, as a means, Ramadan as a means of your you know, forgiveness and your encouragement for the rest of your year itself. So going back to, to, to Ram, post-Ramadan time itself. Now Ramadan is gone, what should I do? Right? That, that's something that, 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 that should be there. There should be two things which should be the first and foremost thing that we should have in our minds. The Quran says, لَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ When you are grateful, he said, I will increase for you. When you are grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for anything, He will increase for you. وَلَإِن كَفَرْتُمْ And when you are ungrateful. And now I ask you this question, right? I don't want to make it a dry lecture and talk. So I want you to complete the sentence for me. When you are grateful, I will increase for you. When you are ungrateful, what should be the sentence? What, what comes to our mind? Right? If, when you are grateful, I will increase for you. When you're ungrateful, most likely you would say it would decrease for you, right? That would be most of us perceptions, and maybe this is what the what, what the ayah of the Quran says. But that's not what the Quran is saying. The Quran says, La in shakartum la azidanakum. Be grateful, I will increase for you. Wala in kafartum, but if you become ungrateful, in the adab ila shadeed, the punishment of Allah is very severe. Look at the comparison. He didn't say that if you are grateful, I will increase. If you're not grateful, if you're ungrateful, I will decrease that. If you're grateful, I will increase. If you're ungrateful, that means you have called upon the wrath of your Lord. You have called upon the anger of not being grateful for so many things you have. In ta'udhu ni'matallahi la tuhsuha, one of the verses of the Quran said, if you were to sit down and start counting the blessings of your Lord, you won't be able to. So the first two things to do post Ramadan, number one. Whatever good you were able to accomplish, be grateful. Even though it was not as what you planned prior to Ramadan. Maybe your plan was to recite the whole Quran one time, two times, whatever it was. Maybe your plan was to do the, 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 the prayers at night for these many times. Or your plan was to give that much charity or yours. This. Whatever you were able to accomplish, point number one, be grateful. Be thankful for whatever you were able to get accomplished. Because of your thankfulness and your gratefulness, that will be increased for you. Number two point, which is attached to this point is, and whatever you are not able to accomplish. Right? And I always, uh, you know, whenever I speak to my congregants, my people, I always tell them that post Ramadan, set goals for yourself. If you don't set goals, you won't be able to be productive. In order to be productive in Ramadan, you have to establish goals for yourself. So now if you were not able to accomplish certain goals and you did not do so, seek Allah's forgiveness. Two things. Be grateful for what you did. Seek forgiveness but for what you could not do. These two things will allow you to do the good for the rest of your life. They said this, these are the two keys to steadfastness, istiqamat. The word istiqamat in, in Arabic refers to steadfastness. And steadfastness is amongst the greatest blessings of our Lord. So be grateful for whatever you were able to accomplish. Seek forgiveness for whatever you were not able to do. Two things you should do. Now what should I do as a game plan for myself, right? What should be my next 11 months or 10 and a half months? 
how should they be spent? Starting off from a very small hadith and saying of the Prophet, peace be upon him. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, The most beloved action in the sight of your Lord are those which are then continuous even though they are very small. Very small, but they are done continuously. Maybe I was doing extra nawafil and extra prayers and so much time in, in Ramadan and post Ramadan, if I'm not doing anything, that's not what, what Ramadan meant for us. Ramadan is to give us something continuous for the rest of our lives. So I would humbly suggest for all of us to set goals for ourselves for the rest of the few months that we have and of course the months that are coming in front of us to set goals that I can do but something that I can do continuously. What can I do continuously? Number one, the month of fasting is gone, but the fasting is still with us. Many a times we think Ramadan is gone, so the fasting is also in the books. We'll see next year when Ramadan comes. Fasting may be gone. The month of fasting may be gone from us, but fasting is still there. The month of Shawwal. This is the 10th month in the Islamic calendar, which is known as the month of Shawwal. The Prophet, peace be upon him, mentioned that anyone who fasts for six days, man sama sitta fi shawal, the hadith mentions anyone who fasts for six days in this month of Shawwal, and they had also fasted the days of Ramadan, it is as though that they fasted for the entire life, mm -hmm. meaning a continuous reward for them. So the first thing that we can do post Ramadan, and of course continuing on in after months too, the month of Ramadan may not be with us anymore, but fasting itself, is with us. If you can, yes, six fasts of Ramadan. If you can't, then any. If, uh, you know, may Allah allow us this opportunity, if you ever get to go to the Kaaba in the, in the city of the Prophet, peace be upon him, it's such a blessing to be there. You will see that every Monday and Thursday, everyone collectively opens their fasts together. It's an environment that people collectively are opening <coughs> their fasts. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, would very often fast on Mondays and Thursdays. If you can't, then maybe sometimes in a month, once or twice, just so that can, you can revive that sunnah. So either, you, you you know, the month of Ramadan may be gone, but fasting should not be left for us. Yeah, that's number one. Number two, شَهْرُ رَمَضَانَ الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنِ Chapter number two, verse number 185, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning that the month of Ramadan when he introduces. So for example, if I was to ask anyone, or even a person who does not know about Islam, if I was to ask them what is Ramadan, what would be the first word that would come to their mind, right? Most likely fasting, right? Most likely fasting. If I was to ask any one of you, Ramadan, what do you, what would you think? Someone would say more time in the masjid, someone would say Tarawih Salah, uh, and, and some of the people from India and Pakistan would say oily food for 30 days, and like, you know, getting almost heart attacks and stuff, like all that stuff that, that's common in Ramadan. But in general, when you talk about Ramadan, you, you think about fasting. The Qur'an itself, when it introduces Ramadan, it introduces Ramadan not as fasting, but it says the month of Ramadan is the month of Qur'an, the book of Allah, right? So now the, the month of Qur'an may be gone. Oh, uh, Bogo, it had, a, it had a word. It said, last seen five minutes ago. Or sometimes it even says online. And on the other side, it had the picture of Qur'an. And on top of it, it said, last seen, last Ramadan. Mm -hmm. Meaning, the last time that a person touched the Qur'an was last Ramadan. And ever since Ramadan was in the books, some people may never even have touched the Qur'an. So it's important that the month of Qur'an may be finished, but let's not, you know, break our connection with the Book of Allah. The Qur'an itself, mentions, and of course I'm, I don't want to go towards another topic, but the Qur'an itself mentions two things as shifa, as health, as cure. And there are many other things but the Qur'an itself. Only Qur'an, 114 surah, 6,000 plus verses of the Qur'an, two things are mentioned as shifa, which means cure. One is honey, of course there's an entire topic in detail to why honey is mentioned, and the number two thing is Qur'an itself. Quran itself, the Book of Allah, is cure for us. Attach yourself to it. If you can't read a lot, just few verses, but every single day. Just remember the hadith that I mentioned. The most beloved action to, the, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are those 
which are done continuous even though they are very small. If you can only get a page in, that's fine. If you can only get half a page in, that's fine. But make sure that you schedule your time in such a way that you give exclusive time to the Book of Allah every single day. We, we have schedules for everything. If in, in our 24 hour life, every day, if we cannot take five minutes for the Book of Allah, that means that there's something wrong, right? Mm -hmm. I, uh, you know, I tell my friends, I'm not sure how true it is, they said that um, an average man touches their phone 500 times a day. <coughs> I say, I won't talk about the sisters how many times they touch. I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> so it, it, I don't know how true that is, but they say an average man touches their phone 500 times a day. I said, SubhanAllah, only if that was the Quran, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that you know, phone, all these things are important for us, but within the midst of all these things, let's try to push and, and schedule in few moments of the Quran, right? Consider that as your need. You know, when you, when you consider something as your need, you will make sure that you will take time for this. When something is, if not, if, if something is not important to us, then we'll just brush it off, right? We won't have time for it. If you have someone who's not too close of a friend for you, and if you're somewhere far away, you say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm out of town, I can't be there, I'm a little far away. But if someone really close to you, even though you're busy, say, just hold up, I'm just gonna make some time, I'm gonna come, I'm gonna see you. Just stay there, I'm gonna be there in a little while. So now, if we have importance to the Book of Allah, we will take our time. So number two is, take our time for the Book of Allah. Number one was fasting. The, fast, the month of fasting may be gone, but fasting are still with us. Whatever you can, optional fast, just so that you can continuously feel the need of fasting. And I, I in one of the, the town of Hempstead, which is one of the, the biggest township uh, in Nassau County itself, I was the keynote at the, the iftar, the annual iftar, and I shared this thought with them and I said, you know what, everyone must be hungry because the fast was going to open there that day at 8.27. I said, all of us are waiting for the sunset and for all of us, our hunger will be gone at the time of sunset. It's already planned. We already know what's the menu. We even know what we're going to eat tomorrow because someone has already invited us and they already told us the menu. For all of us, I, I, I said that to the, to the, to the people in, in the, the annual star meeting. I said, for all of us, our hunger will finish at the time of sunset. But there are so many people across the globe who will never see that sunset. Mm -hmm. Their hunger will always continue for them. They will always wish that, where would that sunset come that I can also break my fast? They can eat with a full stomach. So remembering the concept of fasting for the entire year. Let not this only be in Ramadan. Let this be continuous. Number two, let the Quran be a part of your life for the rest of your life. Every single day. Read about the Quran every single day. That's something which is very, very important. Number three, uh, keeping yourself in the company of, of, of the righteous and to anchor yourself. You know, as if you have something very expensive, your boat, your yacht, you anchor it. You do not want the storms and the winds to take you really far away. Anchor yourself, connect yourself. No matter how far we will go, we will always come back towards it. We need to anchor ourselves towards something which is good, something which is positive, that can always bring us back towards goodness. And, and if, if we anchor ourselves, yes, the world itself and the, the things that we are involved in, we'll always have all these responsibilities and things come in our life, but. But the main thing is that the anchor will always pull us back towards itself. So post Ramadan, this is something that we should always try towards. You know, this is something that we, we, we have to try towards. And of course, remembering the hadith of the Prophet, peace be upon him, that two days of a believer can never be the same. Every single day, I should be increasing in what I have done yesterday. The way that I prayed, the way that I, I made my dhikr, I made my, my supplication, every single day, my character, everything I should be in that, advancing every single day. If I'm not doing that, the Prophet, peace be upon him, said two days of a believer can never be the same. So every day I should be enhancing in my prayers, my, 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 my relationship with my families and friends and people. Uh, and, and, and of course, the Prophet, peace be upon him, said something so beautiful. He said, and everything he said was so beautiful. He said, Khairun nas, man yanfa'un nas. The greatest of the person is that who is the most beneficial to others. What benefit am I giving the society? Everyone knows how to live for themselves. 
And that's why the Prophet said, you can never be a believer until you do not love for others what you love for yourself. <coughs> Imam Abu Dawood, who is a very great scholar of his time, he said, I studied 400,000 hadiths. 400,000 sayings of the Prophet. Then I extracted them towards four. Any individual who studies and practices these four ahadith is as though that they study these 400,000 ahadith. Amongst those four is this one hadith that I just mentioned to you. You can never be a believer until you love for others what you love for yourself. You cannot. Post Ramadan, this feeling has to be developed for you. Post Ramadan feeling has to do. I'm going to quickly mention the other three so that, that remains with you guys. One of the hadith the Prophet said, Actions are dependent upon your intention. The famous hadith, which is in every book, uh, you know, is almost a starting hadith. Actions are dependent upon its intention. Number two, he mentioned such a beautiful hadith. He said, Al halal wal haram Halal, which is clear, and haram, which is impure, is also clear. And whatever is between is doubtful. Avoid doubtful so that you can protect your faith. Mm -hmm. And then he mentioned, indeed, there is a piece of flesh in a human body. If that is correct, the entire body is correct. If it's corrupted, the entire body is corrupted. Remember, this is the heart of an individual. So that, that's the second hadith. Number three, the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, the excellence of a believer is to avoid things which have no use for him. Min husnil islam al mar'i tarku malayim. The excellence of a believer is to avoid things which are irrelevant. Things which have nothing to do with me and no benefit in this world and hereafter, avoid it. And once when we avoid that, that's the excellence of one's faith. And of course the fourth one is that we can never be a believer until we love for others what we love for ourselves. So now he mentioned this as a hadith, but something that we practically need to take back with us. The importance of post-Ramadan actions is that our lives should change. Ramadan should have an effect upon us. Ramadan should leave an impact upon us. Alhamdulillah, I have a blessing to go to Hajj for many years, in previous years. Every year I come back and people ask, and a lot of people, we have about 400 people go with Hajj every year. So a lot of people say, you know, how do I know my Hajj is accepted? How do I know my Hajj is accepted? I said, no one knows except for Allah. No one can make the judgment that, that, that your Hajj is accepted or not. But there are signs. And the sign is that if you see yourself completely turned towards the obedience of Allah and things that you really wanted to let go of and you were able to let go of and start a life which was of goodness, that means that, that some way our Hajj is accepted. And I say post Ramadan, that if, if we were able to accomplish something good, and that became a part of my life, and I continuously took this further, and it was something that I really did not want it to be a part of my life, and I let go, and I continued my life like this, that means my Ramadan was sort of successful. And we have to be grateful. We can never be. Uh, we can never become, you know, proud upon our own accomplishment. But be grateful to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So I'm gonna actually leave the ten minutes for question. Do you guys do Q and A at the end or no? Mm, yeah. Oh yeah. So we're gonna leave some things times for the Q and A.